All right, ladies, you are going to love this one. In this episode, I get to interview Dr. Laura. She's a functional medicine health strategist. She specializes in women's health and high performance. She takes a female-centric approach to health and wellness, and her passion is teaching women how to lean into what's going on in their hormones, their cycles, and their brain to help create peak performance and know when we need to rest. In this episode, you're basically going to have an incredible understanding of what's going on in each phase of your cycle if you are still getting your cycle. And if you're a woman who's going through perimenopause or you're in postmenopause, we are gonna absolutely touch on that as well. You are gonna walk away with all the tools and strategies that you need to feel your best. Most importantly, you are gonna understand the times in your cycle when you need and crave more inward time, perhaps more alone time, so that as much as possible, you can schedule this into your life, your work, and your family. You are gonna feel so empowered and inspired from this one. Enjoy. Welcome, Dr. Laura. I am so excited to have you here, and I know we're just gonna dive right in, so thank you for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to, I feel like this is how we catch up now on podcasting. <laughs> right, right. When you when you live across the country. But yes, I'm, <laughs> this is an incredible episode. This is for any woman who perhaps at some point through your cycle or through the month, whether you're cycling or not, has had those feelings. We all get these feelings now and then of like, I'm just not feeling it. I just don't have it in me. Whether it's maybe not feeling social or just needing a break. There are reasons that we feel this way through our our cycle, and in this episode, we're going to help empower you to understand how to live life in alignment with your cycle. What this is going to look like is ultimately knowing the times of your cycle to plan your social events, the times of your cycle to plan downtime, um, catching up on your Netflix docu-series, getting a massage if you have access to that, or just having a little bit of you know nurturing time as much as we can in the reality of life. And then we're also going to talk about the impact of our brain and changing hormones. And don't worry if you are in perimenopause or menopause, we are also going to apply this to women whose cycles have dramatically changed. I'm so excited. I can't wait for this conversation. This is my my favorite stuff to talk about in the world. Me too. All right. So the goal of you know a lot of this information, again, like I said, is to help empower women. So the main topics that we're going to hit in this episode are just like I said, but kind of so people understand uh, the flow of this conversation is we're first going to talk about how to really beat burnout by living life as much as possible in alignment with our cycle. Then we'll talk about the impact of the brain and what these hormones actually do to our brain. And there's a ton of recent research I know Dr. Laura is going to bring up. We're going to talk about biohacking for women. We're all hearing about, you know, sauna and cold plunge and the importance of building lean muscle. And if there's times in our cycle when we should be doing those things and times in our cycle when maybe it's not as beneficial. We're gonna talk about plant medicine and some other tools and resources that women can use to help impact how they're feeling. And then we will wrap things up with some incredible freebies that Dr. Laura has. So Laura, let's just start with, you know, as a female and as a hormone expert, Why do you think this knowingness of, you know, the hormones and how they fluctuate throughout our cycle is so important for women? It's really a core aspect of who we are, right? And I I think getting more in touch with just how we are wired to operate day to day actually is the key to resolving a lot of the the quote unquote problems that we face in trying to trying to do all of the things. Because the reality is in today's modern world, we're moms, we're partners where we have our own careers, we're working, like we have a lot of different roles and we're doing that in a system that really hasn't been designed to honor our natural biological fluctuations throughout the month, right? Like we live in a nine to five, 24 hour repeatable world that's much more primed to match really men's circadian rhythms, men's, you know, biology. They're they're pretty much the same every 24 hours. You guys are a little bit predictable. But really all of these different aspects of life, they don't really reflect the changes that are constantly going on in our bodies as women. I mean, we, we literally are different women every day of the month in our cycle, right? So wouldn't it not make sense? Okay. Well, maybe I should start learning about how I'm different. Even if I'm looking at like each week in my menstrual cycle to understand, like, maybe this is why I feel this way emotionally. Maybe this is why I feel this way physically. Maybe this is why I feel this way socially. 
And if we can start to understand, it avoids women scratching their heads and being like, man, why do I feel this way? Why does it feel like everyone else can do it all? They can do the things. And I just don't feel that way all the time. Like sometimes I'm on, sometimes I'm not on. Mm -hmm. Uh, And really, I think the reason so many women are burnt out is because we're pushing and trying to do all of these things perfectly every day, the same way. And it's like complete insanity when we're just not we're literally not biologically wired to perform the same way every day. And this isn't a bad thing. It's just a different thing than the way men operate. And if we can learn to honor that and understand it, it makes it so much easier to figure out like, what do I need today? What kind of workout do I need today? What do I need to eat? What do I need for self-care? And it kind of moves us away from this tendency to turn all those things into a giant to-do list you know, which just adds more to our plate and adds more stress. It's really about coming back to, okay, how do I live my one life on this planet in a way that feels really good for my body so that I can give myself what I need and then show up much better for the people around me as a result. A hundred percent. I love this. You know, from this information, how it's impacted my life as a woman, and this is what I want women to take away from this episode is just like you said, you know, I think we get into a cycle of like shame or guilt or not enoughness, right? Like I see this woman, whether it's social media or otherwise, and she's out there crushing it and I'm just exhausted. Well, if that ever hits me throughout the month, I'm very now aware of, I'm like, well, she's probably in a very different phase of her cycle than I am. And right now I'm informed and I understand why I'm feeling the way that I'm feeling. And it helps us come from a place of empowerment right? So I know we're going to go through each week of the cycle. So make sure you guys hang out for that part. And like I said, we will uh, relate this to women whose cycles have also changed. But, you know, in the reality of life, sometimes we can't completely live around our cycle, right? So like if there's a week where um, we're feeling more internal or, you know, it's more of a nurturing week based on what hormones are happening, sure, it doesn't necessarily mean you can take the week off and spend it on the couch like maybe you want to, But can we reframe our intention for some of those days to realize, okay, this is going to be a little bit more of an internal day. So although I have all these meetings and all these commitments, can I come from a place of just simply being present and listening rather than feeling like I need to be the the light in the room and be the social one? Like this helps us lean into exactly what's going on. And uh, I don't know, for me, it's completely changed like that guilt around how I'm showing up or not. Is that how you feel? Absolutely. And, and to take it even a step further, right? I think right now, if, if anyone's listening and you've kind of been in like the cycle syncing algorithm, it's kind of gotten misinterpreted as just like, eat this, work out this way, don't do that. And that's not really what it is. This is at a deep core level, understanding what's happening with you throughout your cycle. And maybe a week that, like you said, Melissa, you are primed to be very internal. Like I'm thinking of like day 23 to 27. It's like, I don't always want to be super social, but if I know that's where I'm at and at the same time, if I have things that I need to show up for, right, maybe I have a bunch of clients that week. Maybe I do have a a speaking presentation or something that I'm doing, right? Maybe there's a big event that I actually do want to go to like mentally, but physically and emotionally, it doesn't feel as as good. I know, hey, okay, this is why I'm feeling this way, right? Like, it's not that I don't want to do these things. It's just that I'm I'm not like wired right now hormonally to be super excited about being out there and being in this, a bunch of big crowd of people and things like that. So what can I do to pour into myself to enjoy that as much as I can. So instead of like dragging myself there and being miserable and Mm -hmm. everyone can feel like when we're out and we're miserable, right? Like maybe I can take a little bit of time before those events, just like me, a little quiet time for me and go internal and, and make sure that I'm really prioritizing that time that I need. Maybe it means I need a little bit of mood support through my food and supplementation just to kind of help with some of those shifts that are happening so that I don't feel quite as poorly. I don't feel, you know, maybe people get a little anxious before their period or they just feel a little emotional. Well, maybe I can do extra things to support myself so that I can go out and do the things I want to do and still feel my best. Uh, so it's, it's also this level of awareness of, okay, well, if I know where I'm at and I know what my strengths and I don't want to say weaknesses, but my, you know, just the areas that where I might not feel as great and I still need to show up, I know exactly how and where to support myself to, to make it just so much easier on me so that I can enjoy that experience and not feel like I'm just 
dragging myself to do something just because. A hundred percent. I want to make sure when we go through the phases of the cycle and again, support for women whose cycle has changed, I want to make sure we touch on every single one of those tools. So you guys will absolutely get that. I think what it also does is it reminds you that, you know, sometimes, so say you have that social event and you're not feeling it, like where can you carve out space to give your body what it needs, right? In addition to the tools and support, like, can you maybe leave the event early and promise yourself a nice bath? Or if today is really busy and you're not super feeling it, but you've got to push through, we all have those days you got to just like put the lip gloss on and push through. What can you promise yourself later in the week or even tomorrow to create that space? I also think the last thing, and then I want to move on to really talking about the brain because I love let's, you know, help empower women to know what's going on with their brain and the hormone connection. And this is my favorite thing. It's like knowing it's a phase because I think so often as women, and I'm curious if you experience this with your clients, we could so easily get into like a future trip and making it worse than it is like, oh my God, what's wrong with me? Why am I feeling like this? Is something happening? No, this is just the week that you're in and next week is going to be different. So it's okay. Ride it out. Don't feel like you have to change it. Like going into it is actually going to help you get the maximum benefit of those beautiful hormones during that time. I absolutely see that. I have a rule with my, a lot of my clients are entrepreneurs and business owners. And I have a rule with them, which is we don't make big business decisions in like the last week of our cycle. Like We, we do not do it then. We're just not wired to look at that uh, from a completely like rational standpoint, it tends to be a time when we do have a lot of those emotions coming through and you can get those feelings that it's like, man, once a month, I just want to like burn it all down and just never like deal with this again. And then, and then two days later, it's like, oh, this is actually fine. This was not, this was not a big deal. It's, and it seems, it seems so big and inflammatory in that moment. And I think, you know, just talking about this cycle awareness is so important because imagine if you weren't able to connect the dots and be like, man, I have these two days every month where I just feel like, I almost feel panicked. I feel hopeless. I feel anxious. And it comes out of nowhere and you don't know why. Like that's a terrifying way to spend a couple of days every month. And then when it finally like clicks and you're like, okay, when I look back, oh yeah, this is always happening at the same point in my cycle. Okay. All right. This actually isn't me. There's nothing wrong with me. This is just a change in hormones and brain chemistry that's happening. And it's frustrating, but it tells me maybe where I can do a little digging to support those areas, make sure that everything is balanced. Maybe there's a little bit of an issue there that I can optimize. And I can also then sit with myself and remind myself, this isn't forever. This is temporary. This is my body's way of telling me I need to just like take a step back, take care of me. Things are going to be okay Mm -hmm. uh, and create that space for myself. Yeah. Love that. And, you know, I know you work with a lot of entrepreneur and business owners, and I really want any woman listening to this to realize whether you're an entrepreneur or business owner or not, I mean, the reality of what those people are doing is juggling many things, which I feel like women nowadays, whether you're a mom, not a mom, entrepreneur or not, like you are running a business within your household, around your household, in your, in your work life, in your relationships, in your families. So every woman can take what we're talking about in this episode and apply it to their lives. This is how you know when you absolutely need to carve out that time to take care of yourself so that you keep can keep going and doing everything that we're doing. 100%. Moms are like the ultimate CEOs. Yeah. <laughs> just, I mean, really any woman, kids or not, like there is just so much we are juggling and we're, we're natural caretakers. So it's like whether you have a sister or parents or siblings, like you're, we're constantly worried about wanting to show up for everyone else. So this is how we really know how to show up for ourselves as well. What are some of the main things that you want women to know about our beautiful brains and how hormones impact them? Yeah, that they're much more closely related than you think. Uh, Really, I mean, our brain is flooded with estrogen and progesterone receptors, right? So if you don't think that brain signaling, brain chemistry is changing, in in alignment with your cycle. Uh, For me, I think that was one of the biggest game changers when it came to just understanding how I operate and how I feel over the course of a cycle. I mean, it's easy, I think, sometimes to focus on the physical symptoms of of hormone-related things, right? Like, oh, I feel a little bloated before my period. But the the brain-based things for me, first, it helped me understand emotionally why sometimes it felt why does it feel so easy to just be like the calm in the storm, to hold space for other people, to like be the calm in the chaos of family and, and, you know, clients and everything else. And other times it feels so challenging and overwhelming and starting to understand 
just like how hormones could impact uh, just different brain neural transmitter production, just different you know cognitive functions of the brain. That was huge. And and you know to even expand on it further. Okay, once I understand the basics of how it impacts me, how now can I can actually like leverage this to be more efficient and to like really lean into the skills that might be a little easier and I'm just wired to do at different points in my cycle. So I'm thinking being just a a business owner and things like, like you said, there's a lot of different things to juggle, right? There's working with clients, there's marketing, there's talking to your team, there's creative work, there's putting out content, like there's a thousand different hats you can wear and you actually can be wired to do some of those skills at different points in your cycle more than others. So it actually completely changed how I set up my workflow just day to day, month to month, really, instead of being like, okay, every day I'm going to do this or every Monday I'm going to do this. Now it's like, I take things a month at a time be like, okay, where can I block the skills that I'm really wired to do really well in this phase and save the other ones for later, because then I'll be wired to do them really well later. Uh, To me, that was always the key to productivity. I think sometimes people think productivity is just doing more, but really to me, it's all about how efficient am I being with my working hours? Because I don't want to work till nine o'clock every night forever. I want to like free up that time to do fun things and to take care of me and to be with people I love. So understanding how to, you know, align the things that I have to do for work to how my brain functions best based on my hormones, uh, has actually freed up so much time for me to do more fun things in life, which I think everybody probably wants. Yeah, because you're more efficient. So let's just simplify this concept. Talk to me about um, what does it mean to have these receptors in our brain? What's actually happening? Let's use like estrogen for an example. So a whole bunch of parts of the brain have estrogen receptors. So if we think about what's happening with our menstrual cycle, we have the front half of our cycle, which tends to be much more estrogen as the kind of star of the show. Well, now when we have more estrogen in the body, they're flooding those receptors in the brain. And we know that they're in areas of the brain that control things like executive function, leadership skills, creativity, big picture planning. Uh, Those are like just a lot of the, the parts of the brain maps that we know have these receptors. So of course it would make sense that times when we're in our cycle that we do have more estrogen, we would want to do those things right? We we would want to tap into our leadership skills. We would want to tap into our big picture planning. We would want to do creative work and and content creation and things that really we're we're wired to do. On the flip side of that, when we think about later in life, as estrogen starts declining, wouldn't it make sense then that maybe we struggle with some of those things from a cognitive perspective? There's a reason that we see women in postmenopause have faster rates of cognitive decline. And some of it has to do with estrogen isn't flooding the brain anymore. So it might feel like you have more brain fog. It might feel like you can't be as clear and focused on like planning and the big picture because now we're not getting binding to all those estrogen receptors in the brain. Got it. So it's not that there's anything wrong with you. It's that there's no there's no estrogen floating around to bind to those and light up those parts to to help you really excel in those skills. Again, I think that's like such a big take home for women. I, I think we so often go to this place of what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And none of this is what's wrong with you. This is empowering you with the information to understand what's happening. So it's not like this vast am I not eating right? Am I overstressed? Am I like, you don't even know where to turn. And this is like, boom. Okay. How can we support the brain? How can we support these hormone fluctuations and how can we make our life as much as possible line up with, with what's going on in our cycle? So basically what you're saying is there's these aspects of the brain and every aspect of the brain has a different job. And estrogen receptors tend to live in the places where we're like, very good at directing, very good at like being in charge and here's what we need to do. And probably like energetic and um, organizational. And then there's parts of our brain that are going to be more about uh, going inward, right? And doing some other aspects of things that are important in our lives. And I know we're going to get to that really soon with the cycle syncing. And, you know, one of my friends uh, said it this way, and I love it. She said that perimenopausal or menopausal women, most likely menopausal women, are operating like a manual car whereas we all have an automatic. So when you have your cycle, it's this automatic car that these hormone fluctuations are happening at all times. And as much as like 
I think when we're in this phase of our life where we are getting a period, there can be times when we're like, oh my gosh, like I don't like feeling this way before my period. But I, it does seem the more that people are talking about menopause, we will miss these years because yes, we get the lows, but we also get the highs, right? We get that estrogen flooding of our brain where we do feel like the CEO and someone in menopause does not have that. So I know we recently were chatting online about a book that I've, I recently got the book um, XX Brain. Such a good book. Highly recommend that for anyone in perimenopause and menopause but just how devastating it can feel. And then knowing you're not alone, like this is literally what's happening. So I do want to go ahead and just, and just talk about uh, the menopausal phase right now, before we go into the weeks of the cycle. So as you support women in that time in their life, um, what kinds of things are you doing to help them, you know, match the hormones that they're missing? I know there's a lot going on in research with bioidentical hormones? Are they good? Are they bad? Do they cause cancer? Should we be taking these? These women just want to feel normal. So how do you support them? Because I know you take a very holistic approach and a very real approach. And some of it depends on like, wh where am I meeting a woman in that phase of her journey? Like, I think there's a lot of confusing terminology around out there around menopause. Like menopause, the phrase, it's literally like, it is a day in your life. It is the day that you're like, I have not had a period for 12 months menopause, it happened. Before that, you're perimenopausal. After that, you're postmenopausal. So figuring out where women are in that spectrum, are they kind of in the point where they're like, I'm not having a period every month. I'm like, maybe I'm getting hot flashes. I know I'm close to that, but there's still some cyclical activity or are they, are they out of that? They haven't had a period for a few years. Those, those two things are still very different, right? Cause one, there is a little bit more endogenous hormone production and the other one, not so much. In my mind, I think it, it's really first and foremost, it comes down to mindset before we work into other things and kind of understanding like this is a new part of my life. And like I, I feel like menopause and postmenopause, it's like having a moment right now, a very well deserved moment. Yeah. Um, there's just like some incredible physicians out there creating content to like help educate women on this and just put more info out there. Because I think the healthcare industry as a whole is kind of like, done this population dirty in the last couple of decades. Yeah. It just really scared women about hormone replacement, told them this is just how it is, told them like, here's an antidepressant, see you later. Like mm -hmm. none of that is really health and wellness care. And really first and foremost, it's understanding like, okay, this is, this is a new phase of my life, but I have a lot of life left. I mean, this is happening around on average age 51 for women. Like you have a lot of years left. And like, I don't want women to spend all those years, decades of their life frustrated and hopeless and just be like, oh, this is what it is now. Right. So starting to understand like, okay, here's, here's the new me. Here's what's happening under the hood now. I don't have all those crazy hormone things, which sometimes might feel good. Other times I might miss them a little bit because we also know that when hormones drop out post-menopause, it also increases disease risk for women in a couple of different areas. It increases our risk of insulin issues, of metabolic syndrome, of cardiovascular disease, of cognitive decline and dementia, and bone loss, osteoporosis. Like, it, It's very clear that there is a decline overall in health when we lose the protective effects of those hormones. So I do think if women are good candidates for hormone replacement, looking into things like bioidentical hormones can actually be a game changer for a lot of women. There was a study in like the early nineties, the women's health initiative that basically like scared a bunch of women and doctors into saying that like hormone replacement causes cancer, don't take it. Mm -hmm. uh, we know now there's lots of literature that that's not the case. And especially when we look at bioidentical hormones, um, if women are good fits for it, it can confer a lot of health benefits. It can reduce these risks of metabolic issues of cognitive decline. It's really when we're looking at synthetic hormones, specifically synthetic progesterone, um, it's called MPA. That's actually the one that carries some risk with it of adverse cardiovascular events of cancers. So like, really, we don't want to see people prescribing women synthetic progesterone things like that. We actually want to see them saying, okay, can we find a good solid bioidentical estrogen and a good bioidentical progesterone if that's the things that they need, even testosterone, and figure out a combination that works for each woman. And it's a little bit of trial and error because there's lots of different forms and sometimes women have to try different things out and they got to figure it out. Alongside that, we're also looking at okay, if we're going to introduce bioidentical hormones into this person, how can we also look at the changes in their underlying physiology and support those things through nutrition and lifestyle and mindset, right? 
how do we eat in a way that helps support our new new metabolic world, which is after menopause, women tend to be less insulin sensitive or more likely to become insulin resistant and have, have these issues. So can we, in our diet, make sure that we get really fat adapted? Can we learn how to maybe like cycle keto in and out? Can we make sure we're not overdoing it on the carbs and sugar? Because now we're really not good at handling them. Mm -hmm. Um, How do we like really change our diet for the better? Can we increase protein even more to offset age-related muscle loss? Can we make sure that we're we're getting really good nutrient-dense food with lots of minerals in it? Can we really take care of, I think this is key too, our, our stress and our response to stress and our relationship with stress because we just don't handle it quite as well as we used to. And the adrenal glands are also now pretty much the only thing that's responsible for making hormones since the ovaries have kind of checked out um, by that point. So really starting to understand, okay, how do I support healthy cortisol production? How do I support healthy adrenal function? Really relationship with stress and not just emotional stress. I also mean nutritional stress, life stress, all those sorts of things. Um, really, you know, prioritizing rest and recovery and making sure we're also changing even the way we work out, right? Like postmenopausal women need to be strength training. Even if you don't love it, like you've got to do it now because now you're, you are fighting age. We are fighting age-related muscle and bone loss. And it's, it's got to be the same thing as like drinking water every day. Like now I'm going to do weight-bearing exercise. I'm going to lift as heavy as I can and make sure that I, I keep myself metabolically healthy as long as possible to reduce my risk of disease. So it's it's slightly different focal points now because now it's it's an accelerated aging process compared to before. And we can help that process a lot with things like bioidenticals with targeted supplementation, but the lifestyle stuff also still has to happen, right? Like the, the pills, those sorts of things, they're never going to be a cure all. You, ha- you have to do it alongside these other avenues. Okay. I feel like a couple other things that are kind of having their moment right now that we can apply to, you know, postmenopausal years are circadian rhythm in nature. So I want to pick your brain on that. And then also we're seeing a lot out there, you know, as far as research, research and studies on plant medicines, right? Like this microdosing psilocybin and things like that. So what's your take on both of those things? All right, hold the phone, quick break. I promise you we'll get back to that episode in just a second, but I need to interrupt it for a real important message. So many of us women need and crave moments of downtime throughout the day. We yearn for like five minutes to ourselves where we have nothing to do physically, running around, and we can actually stop thinking about all the details that we're managing all throughout the day. But what happens when we actually get these breaks? So often we sit, we maybe take a minute, And it feels weird. We don't know what to do with ourselves when we're alone. And so what do we do? We distract ourselves. We get on digital world. Well, the reality is, is that although this might feel good in the moment, it does nothing for us. And more importantly, we need and deserve not only a physical break where we can actually sit for a moment, but a mental break. Going on digital world does not give us a mental break. It's actually one of the most mentally stimulating things that we can do. And that's why it never actually feels like it did anything when we're done. It doesn't feel good. It has been a mystery for so long for so many women what to actually do with these few minutes that is passive and easy, but can actually help us feel less scattered and more connected. Well, I'm here to tell you I have cracked the code, I have solved the equation, and I'm here to share it with you as a free resource. All the info you need is below. It's called the connection code. I made you a printable guide where you can fill out the details that apply to you to make this a personal experience just for you. I'm going to walk you through every single thing. All you need to do is go to beinspiredmama.com forward slash connection or click on the link and you will get everything that you need to start to feel less scattered and more connected. I'm so excited to walk you through this process. I mean, circadian rhythm, I yes, it's definitely having a moment and like for good reason. I mean, this is really what governs our biology too, right? Our energy, our sleep, everything else. And it's, it's really one of our basic needs as a a creature on this planet, right? Like we look around at animals, things like that. They're very in tune with circadian rhythm. Some animals come out in the day, some come out at night, but like that governs how, how active they are. And they're, they're very aligned with that. We as humans have gotten away with that just between artificial lighting and our schedules and things like that. But really circadian rhythm, I think we don't, I think people are becoming more aware of just how much it impacts all of these other hormone pathways, how much it impacts our mental health, how much it impacts our disease risk. Like it's, it's huge. And it can feel weird at first when you're like, okay, I'm going to 
you know, not use overhead lighting after dark and just do my little salt lamps and, you know, maybe switch all my light bulbs out for a nice warmer orange bulb instead of a bright fluorescent bulb. And maybe I'm going to wear some weird sunglasses in the airport on an overnight flight. But I also know that I'm going to sleep better when I do these things. Quality sleep. I'm going to have more energy. My cortisol production is going to be regulated. I'm not going to be adding excess stress to my body. And it's really just like one of those basic human needs. I mean, like I think of things, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, the circadian rhythm is sun exposure, like getting out, getting in the sun. And I feel like we had a weird phase where people were all afraid of the sun all of the time. Like, Mm -hmm. I can't can't go in the sun. It's bad. We actually really need it for a lot of things. Timing can matter. I'm not suggesting anybody go like lay in the sun all day and get burnt to a crisp, but getting out in the morning, getting out in the evening, getting in the fresh air, being in, getting hit with those different like hues from the sun, being out in nature, getting away from our, away from our devices, away from being like stuck inside all day. I don't know if everyone understands how much that can impact like your physical and your mental health. I have a lot of clients who They'll always say things like, yeah, my grandma always told me if I'm stressed to just like go outside and drink a glass of water. And it's like, yeah, grandma had it right. Like, yeah, get outside and drink a glass of water. That's usually all you need for a little reset. It's amazing. I think, you know, thank God we're really getting back to the basics. Like in this age of call it biohacking, whatever we want to call it. And I know we're going to touch on that too in a minute. It's like about all these outside in devices. And I think they all have their place. I love all these things. I use them, right? I talk about them a lot. And also, we're kind of forgetting about the basics. And so, you know, one of the things I tell people is like simply take five, right? Take five in the morning and five at night. And if all we change was our light in those times. So five minutes of sunlight in the morning, if you can, like that's the first thing that we need to do. I've um, actually implemented this with our kids. So before they can get on screens in the morning, they have to get sunlight like I do an acronym for screens and I just do the first few letters, but sunlight, chores, connection, relationships. Like those are your three things. And if you check those off, then you can go on your screen. So same thing for adults, right? Like before we pick up that blue light, white light, get sunlight. If you're not in an area where there's sunlight or if it's too cold out and you just don't want to do it, there's some great light resources that we all use and love. We'll we'll, um, plug them below. And then at night, like Dr. Lohr was saying, if you can just start to, you know, impact your light in your home, it makes a huge difference for hormones. And then also I think, you know, can we touch on the melatonin serotonin connection? So like what, what's happening at night? Um, What are we missing when we bombard our eyes with light and how does that impact our serotonin and what is serotonin? We'll start with melatonin. I I mean, most people are probably familiar with melatonin. They'll see it in like supplement form that you can buy it. It's like our our hormone that helps us wind down at night. And uh, we're supposed to produce it like later in the day. Like some of the signals for that are lighting cues, circadian rhythm cues, those sorts of things. So if we're, we have to think if we're be like bright lights in our face, fluorescent lights and, uh, you know, phones and screens and all those things, uh, that bright blue light, which blue light, when we think about it, like that's supposed to be middle of the day kind of light. Like you go outside in the middle of the day, it's like, it's very bright. It's blue light. It's white light. It's very energizing. We don't really want that like right before bed, right? Brain is going to interpret that as, oh, it's not bedtime. So we don't, don't make melatonin, right? We don't need to do that. And uh, we want to make melatonin overnight because melatonin also is very closely related to our stress hormone cortisol. They're they're kind of in like a yin-yang pattern. When one is up, the other one should be down. So we should have melatonin up at night. Cortisol should be down at night so that we can sleep through the night. In the morning, as we wake up, cortisol production rises, melatonin comes down. That makes us nice and and energized and ready, ready to go for the day. The other neurotransmitter you mentioned, serotonin, people who are familiar with that often think of it as like happy, happy, joyful happy, joyful neurotransmitter. Serotonin makes us feel good. Mm -hmm. It's, it's what we get produced when we're out in the light, when we see puppies, when we're like very happy around people who we love, when we're getting massages. Um, and it's also a precursor of melatonin. So we actually need serotonin production to even also make that melatonin. So another reason why it's so important to get outside in the sun helps us make serotonin, helps the brain make melatonin later at night. So It seems strange to think like, oh, what I do in the day matters for sleep, but it it absolutely matters. It's not just about that evening routine, which is still important, but actually the things you do during the day, exercising, getting out in the sun, like timing of your eating, those are just as important for your sleep as what happens right before bed. 
Absolutely. And, you know, it seems silly to even say this, but think about it. Our, our eyes are so sensitive to light. And, you know, like you just said, like, it's really important to like, it's almost like we're banking that light during the day to help us shift into what we're supposed to go into at night. And what do most people do in the middle of the day if we go out in the light? Sunglasses completely negates it. So think about every time you go out during the day, you are banking the the hormones and the juicy things that you need to have a great night of sleep and to make your happy chemicals the next day. So try to ditch those sunglasses, right? Would you agree with that? I would. I mean, like, be smart about it. Obviously, if you're out driving and the sun's in your face, like stick on the sunglasses so you don't like you know, get right. in an accident. <laughs> but especially if you're out in the morning, the sun's not like overhead, like you don't need to look at the sun, just mm-hmm. be out in it. You know, the, the light is at least hitting your eye that way, cueing into some of these, some of these signals. So yeah, absolutely. I think if people can spend some time without sunglasses, that is definitely ideal. Okay. So I want to pivot into talking a little bit about biohacking, the way that we as women need to do these things differently. And then let's go right into going through the cycle week by week. We'll just kind of bang out, you know, each part of the cycle so women can take notes and they can know how to plan around and sync their cycle. So when we talk about biohacking and these tools that everybody is now using, red light, sauna, cold plunge, workouts, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, for so long, and this is what I want the women listening to know, women have been left out of research. And the reason that is, is because of our fluctuating hormones. Like Dr. Laura said, men are in general, the same day to day. So when you're doing research on men, there are not a lot of variables. Whereas when you're doing research on women, one, they had to exclude us from a lot of research after the, um, I'm blanking on the name right now. What was that drug that uh, pregnant women took and their babies came out deformed? Um, I'm, oh my gosh. I'm blanking on the name, but I think anyone listening will know that. So after that happened, um, Women were excluded from research in case, you know, they were perhaps pregnant and didn't know it. So that changed major things around research for women. And then they extended that window. This was an XX brain. They extended that window to not just be around women that could be of childbearing years, but it was any woman that was in the chunk of years of her life where she had a menstrual cycle. So what has happened is a lot of science is based on the physiology and biology of a man and not a woman. And a lot of these, you know, sauna and hyperbarics and things like that, that has also been the case. But what we're seeing now, thank God, is our moment as women, and we're figuring out how to work these in around our cycle. So if you are someone who's, you know, heard the benefits of something like cold plunge, and maybe you go to cold plunge and you're like, God, I do not feel this today. Why can she do it? And I can't do it. Well, guess what? You might be in a phase of your cycle that it's not the best time. And listen to that intuition because we know, and I think, you know, I'm definitely going to, I don't want to talk over you. You have your chance on this in a minute, but like my passion is around, like we have this internal guiding system that we have stopped listening to. And I think what has happened is in those moments where we feel guilty or like we're not enough or that we're not doing it right, we actually, our internal guide is like, it's not the time. So from this information, I think it can help empower us to be like, oh, I'm not just feeling that way because I'm not enough. I'm feeling that way because actually my body doesn't align with this right now. I think that's one of the most toxic things about the biohacking space currently is like, I think things are changing, particularly for women in the space, but there is an undercurrent in that space of like, oh, well, if you're not doing it, like you're just not like badass enough, right? You're just not trying hard enough. Like you're just, you're just too soft. And it's like a very toxic energy that I'm just like not not into anymore. So I think, I think first understanding that biohacking, like it doesn't have to be this harsh, aggressive, like, oh, I'm changing my, my body's hardware software system. It's, it's more like gardening. Like, no, I'm really fostering how, how well my body can work and flourish. So like, for me, that's usually the the metaphor I use, because I just think that that that's just more, more apt and more appropriate. Like these different tools that I'm using. Oh, well, I might need this to grow like these flowers a little bit more. And these need a certain amount of sunlight and these need the, that sort of thing, I think is just a different way to look at it. And you're right when it comes to research, like we are still missing a lot of research. I like, oh, I would love to see that like biohacking tools in studies, phase by phase of the cycle and see like what the actual verdict is about each one. But for now, what we can do is we can look at the biochemical impact of different biohacks. We can understand how they affect hormones and neurotransmitters and inflammation. And then we can kind of map that with what we know about 
women's menstrual cycles and say, okay, well, maybe this is more aligned with here because the benefits of this biohack are very aligned with what we want to happen in the body. But here it actually might end up being a stressor, right? So you talked earlier about sauna and cold plunge and like cold plunges can be great to help build resilience. They to help get us energized in the morning, but for women who are in a phase of their cycle where they don't handle stress very well, especially if they're also maybe having on top of that, some hormonal fluctuation or imbalances that further reduce their resiliency, it might do more harm than good in the moment. Right. I was actually just talking to one of my girlfriends recently. She posted on Instagram. She's like, I did a cold plunge for six minutes yesterday. And I feel like I got hit by a truck today. And she just had never thought about it in terms of looking at it, where she's at in her cycle. And for her, if she tries to do that in a couple of days right before she gets her period, it actually has the opposite effect. She doesn't feel good. She actually makes her feel ill and exhausted and more fatigued because it's almost like you get a cortisol dump afterwards. Like it stresses the body out too much and you can't handle it as much. Versus if you want to use a cold plunge to build resilience, to really get those long-term benefits in the body, like maybe in our follicular front half of our phase of our cycle, when we are primed to handle stress, Maybe that's a better time to spend six minutes in a cold tub of water. If you want to do it every day, because that's like a commitment thing, maybe you do a cold shower or you go in for 30 seconds before you get your period just to see how you feel, right? Same goes with the sauna. We know that different lengths of time in a sauna cause different physiological effects. We know that if it's like under 30 minutes, 20 minutes, uh, being in a sauna actually has a very relaxing and calming effect. It actually stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. It can reduce anxiety. We know once we pass the 30 minute effect and start getting closer to 40 minutes to an hour, it actually does increase stress in the body. Now it's a, and it's, it's not a bad stressor. We're doing it for a purpose, but cortisol goes up, stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. The, pur the purposes, the intentions are different. And so we have to think about where am I at in my cycle? What's my intention with this tool? Is my intention that I'm trying to build my resilience to stress today? Or is my intention that I feel anxious and inflamed and irritated and I, I need to calm myself down because I might choose different tools and different timings and different durations based on what's happening there versus doing the same thing every day and being like, sometimes this feels good. Sometimes this sucks. Huh, I don't know. Instead of like, I love what you said earlier about listening to that. It's like that internal compass. I think a lot of us as women, especially if we're we're driven, we're high achievers. We also have wired ourselves to like move past discomfort, be like, this sucks, but I'm going to do it anyway. Right. Uh, maybe sometimes we should listen. Right? It's like a really fine line, but maybe sometimes like, yes, sometimes it's time to push. And other times it's like, this isn't the right way to push. Like there's, there's a different way that I can support myself in achieving my best goals without having detrimental impacts on my physiology. And Ultimately, that's what leads to health issues and burnout and all that kind of stuff in the long run. Absolutely. I mean, I think with all these tools, it's like we're we're coming at them the American way. What we do, what we always do, it's like if some is good, more is better, and that's not the case. So let's go through now cycle uh, throughout the cycle. Let's go week by week, and you know this is really essentially a roadmap. And if you want to take notes, this is a great time to pause, grab something, take notes, and just simply understand that most likely this is actually your internal guide. Like this is probably how you feel at this phase. You just haven't listened yet. And so what my goal is with this part of this episode is to bridge that gap between our internal guide that we have stopped listening to and what's going on physiologically and start to sync them up and start to empower these women that it, there's nothing wrong with you. You're not, not enough. This is just a phase, right? Every phase, the highs and the lows of our cycle are going to switch and change and to start tuning back into that inner guide. Because what I've done with this information personally and what I want for these women is I have taken it and kind of mapped out my cycle. And now I just know I don't have to look at it anymore. I actually, it's like, this is exactly how we feel. Like if we just check in, do I want a cold plunge today? Not really. Maybe I want to stick my face in the cold, but that's about it. Well, you're probably in that phase. So let's yeah. start um, first phase of the cycle. Talk to me about what's happening from a hormonal aspect. Let's touch on... Um, maybe like social calendar or work commitments, biohacks. And then if there is a place for, you know, microdosing some plant medicines in some phases more than others, as far as you know, let's, let's touch on that too. And I'll just do a quick disclaimer before we jump into this. If you're new to learning about these things, don't feel overwhelmed. It's like learning any new skill. Like sometimes you just need to practice it, practice it for a couple of cycles. And then like Melissa said, 
it's going to just become second nature. And you're going to be like, how did I never not know this? But initially it will feel new. And anytime we change our routines and do something new, there can be a little bit of internal resistance, but I promise on the other side is like a much easier life. So much easier life. So we'll start with follicular phase and follicular phase is really like the front half of our cycle. Uh, it, It overlaps a little bit with our bleeding week, but usually women know when they've started to hit it, it's like, around day three or day four, like if day one is the day you start bleeding somewhere around day three or your four, you're like, ah, I feel amazing again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yay. We're in follicular phase and we're going to be here for right up until we ovulate. So generally, you know, 10 to 14 days, um, depending on cycle length, maybe a little longer. Uh, most women feel really good in this phase. This is the phase when hormone production ramps up. We make a lot of estrogen, which is kind of like the star of the show right now. Uh, we tend to feel really good. We tend to feel really good socially. We tend to feel really good mentally. We tend to feel really good physically. Um, estrogen gets a bad rep, but it does a lot of things in the body. And we generally feel really good when it's hanging around. This is a great time to like push ourselves in workouts. Uh, we tend to be more insulin sensitive in this phase. So our metabolism tends to stay a little more, a little more balanced. Uh, we actually are naturally a little more resilient here as well. We handle stress better. Uh, we tend to be very, it's very easy for us to, to kind of stay regulated in this phase for the most part um, compared to later. In terms of what's happening, you know, we had this great conversation earlier about how estrogen can flood the brain and bind to different receptors. So we have to think about, yeah, what were some of those tasks we talked about? In my follicular phase, I'm really good at leadership skills, at executive function, at directing others, at at uh, doing big picture planning, at doing creative work. Like women in their follicular phase are very natural leaders for a reason. So it's a good time to do team meetings, good time that that could be in your household too. Like bring the whole crew together, talk about what's happening. Delegating the chores, family meeting at the table. I need your help guys. Exactly. Here's what I need you all to do. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and we tend to feel more social too. So it is a great time for, for social events. Um, a lot of my clients who are doing like speaking and podcasting, I'm always like, schedule it in this phase. You're going to feel good. I promise. Um, so we tend to feel really, really good when we look at biohacks then, okay, what do we know about this phase? We're more resilient. We can handle stress better. Okay. This is the time to push myself with my biohacks. Maybe I'll do the longer sauna. Maybe I'll do the cold plunge. Maybe I'm going to play around with some fasting. You know, if I want to do a longer fast, I'm going to do it in this phase. Like I'm going to push myself a little bit, take advantage of my ability to weather stress. And I'm going to build up that resilience, right? Build up that resiliency bank. It can be a fun time to push yourself a little bit more and you can handle it and reap the benefits of it, which I think is huge. Mm-hmm. In terms of plant medicine, you know, we were talking before we hopped hopped on here. I'm, I'm most familiar with like psilocybin microdosing and it's the same concept, right? Like, okay, I want to do things that enhance my creativity at a time when I'm already primed to do that. So would it not make sense that this would be a good time to do that? I'm already wired to be a little bit more creative. Like, let me push myself a little bit more and see what else, see what else can happen. See what else I can come up with. Mm-hmm. I actually have a friend who does an amazing microdose cycle sync blend. I'll get you her information after the episode where she actually does slightly different in your follicular versus your luteal phase for a reason, because they're really tuned into that brain function section to section. And in the follicular phase, it's all aimed at being creativity, open to possibilities, like really just uh, enhancing the potential for how well our brain can work. Any other things as far as what we're putting in the body, um, separate from biohacks, but like drinks, caffeine or alcohol, is this a time to be weary of those? Um, Obviously alcohol has a negative impact on the brain. I think we all know that. And, you know, if there is a time when a woman's going to have a glass of wine here and there, is this that time? Any other supplements that come to mind to help support the woman's body? Yeah. So again, so we're thinking about what's happening during this time, right? Like body getting flooded with estrogen. We tend to have more estrogen. So for better or worse, like alcohol use also can increase like estrogen recirculation in the body. So especially if you're someone who's prone to estrogen dominance or like symptoms of excess estrogen, alcohol probably shouldn't have a place at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Uh, Really? Like, I don't want to say like, this is the phase to like go throw one back because there's always risks. Right. Can you probably handle it a little better from a stress perspective? Sure. But it's going to put a strain on the liver, which right now we need to be working well to metabolize all that estrogen and hormones that we're putting out. So even when we look at like supplements, those sorts of things, okay, can we add in things that are supporting the liver to make sure we're metabolizing this estrogen that we're producing? Um, maybe in the diet, we're making sure we do things like ground flax seeds, things like that to help with that. 
things like that, that just overall help with, we have more hormones right now. How do we, how do we break them down? I know people do have a lot of like cycle sync blends out there that you can look at, but my mind, if someone's in the follicular phase is she's working pretty well right now. So if we're doing supplements other than the basics, I just want to make sure she's doing things that help her metabolize and eliminate that excess estrogen, make sure she's going to the bathroom regularly, maybe a little magnesium at night, those sorts of things. Super simple that way. Yeah. I'm going to put some of my favorite liver supports down below because I've got like a milk thistle I take. I kind of take it all throughout the month, but this is a good time. There's castor oil packs for liver. Those are incredible at night. Charcoal at night before bed, I feel like just also kind of helps keep things clean and move in and then magnesium. So we'll link those all below. Okay. Next phase. So at the end of the follicular phase, then if all goes well, we come into the ovulation phase, which is short. Usually this is like ovulation is really happening over 12 to 24 hours. Maybe ovulation phase, we're looking at like two to three days just because we start to get first a surge of hormones being produced in the brain that are going to then go signal the ovaries to ovulate and release an egg. So actually the brain is a really important organ for ovulation. Uh, That's how hormonal birth control works. It cuts off that communication network between brain and ovaries so that you don't release an egg. Um, So brain, brain is very, very important. Um, Ovulation, if it's happening, and the reason that I want women to understand ovulation is you feel really good. Like I, I would hate for women to miss out on this. Like, I know. You talked you, you talked earlier when, you know, sometimes you see other women like killing it and crushing it. Like anytime I'm at an event and I see, a, she's just like, she's glowing and she is magnetic. I'm always like, I bet she's ovulating. Totally. Uh, totally. Cause it's just this energy that you have, right? You have a flood, a huge peak of all of these different hormones, estrogen, testosterone, different things from the brain our skin is glowy. Like we feel good. Like Mm -hmm. we want to be social. People are attracted to us. It's, it's just this, like, mm, it's this feeling. And it's just like a great couple of days. I feel like they're great mental health days to have to just feel that way. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. Yes. Yeah. No, it's Um, so important. This is like when, as a mom, I'm like, that's when I would plan like my kid's birthday party last week when we were in the CEO planning phase. That's when, like, if I'm a, a mom CEO, right. Of my home, that's when I'm laying out like meal plan. That's when I'm like organizing. And then this is when I'm like, okay, let me plan all the social events, all the things I'll have the sleepovers, you know, you take mine another week. <laughs> like this is when you're good to go. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, with that flood of hormones also comes strengths in other areas. Like I love going for PRs in the gym when I'm in that ovulation phase, because I feel so strong Mm -hmm. and I know it's a really good time to like push myself and do those things. Um, So it's a good time to like, just challenge myself physically as well. This phase is also going to be really important for what's next. So what happens in luteal phase is dependent on ovulation occurring. So this is a really important phase to pay attention to. When we look at things like, okay, what do I need to consider nutritionally and in terms of biohacks and all that kind of stuff? Again, so we said big flood of hormones happening, right? So we want to make sure that we're helping our body metabolize and eliminate and process those um, because they're great in the moment. We just don't want them around forever. Mm -hmm. So again, this is a great time for to continue that liver support, estrogen metabolizers. Sometimes I like adding in some little anti-inflammatory things, maybe a little like ginger turmeric juice or something like that just to help again with that excess of hormone production that's happening. Ovulation is a very sensitive process, meaning like I think women should be tracking their ovulation even if they're not trying to get pregnant so they can understand how things they do the rest of the month is impacting it. So I know your friend, Dr. Mindy, talks a lot about things like fasting and the cycle. And sometimes we do have to pay attention to like, what are we doing in ovulation that might negatively impact it. So like maybe we don't want to do a super long fast or something like crazy stressful that might might tell the brain it's not safe to signal the ovaries to release an egg right now. So there are things to consider there. But also if you don't know your body, if you don't know if you're ovulating or not, it's hard to predict if what you're doing is helping or hurting that. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big fan of women spending at least a couple cycles tracking their ovulation um, while also paying attention to things like body temperature, sex drive, mood, cervical mucus, so that eventually you can learn like, oh, I don't need to continually like test myself, do like ovulation testing, because now I know what happens when I ovulate and that's what I'm looking out for. Again, just like back in tune with your body again, right? Yeah. And touching on fasting, you know, Dr. Mindy, her book is an incredible resource. We'll link that below too, because 
again, you know, talking about like fasting for men versus fasting for women, we have to do it differently in accordance with our cycle. So fast like a girl, excellent book to know when to schedule your fasting around your cycle. We'll link that below. And then one of the other really important things, okay, so, so far the, the two phases we've talked about are kind of like the go get it phase, right? I love this saying, everything is a phase, just like the moon, everything is a phase. So whether it's the highs or the lows, the, the goods or the bads. So here is where, and Laura, you empowered me with this, just because you're feeling like fire, like you can go out and crush it, keep in mind that that is going to change. So don't overcommit, right? Because while we're, we're high energy now, we can do all the things we have got to work in. And I know you talk about this a lot with your high performing clients. We have got to work in rest. And I think that's the next phase of the cycle, right? So like knowing not to overcommit and build out our entire month based on how we're feeling in the first part of the cycle. Right. Like you, you will be feeling social during ovulation and you will want to make all the plans. So sometimes having the foresight to be like, wait, when are we going to plan this for? Let me not do it exactly two weeks from now when it's going to be like day 27 of my cycle. And I am not going to want to talk to any human being. Right. So just that little bit of awareness helps a lot with, oh yeah, I didn't like overschedule myself. I didn't like, I'm not frustrated because I know exactly when I'll feel more able to do these things. And it's, for those of you who are listening, who have like partners, this is such a good conversation to have with them yeah. so that you can understand like when you're planning things together or like doing things with other couples, like, Hey, these are times I'm really going to want to do it. These are times that I, I need a little extra time for me. Mm-hmm. Um, get them in on the picture too, because a lot of men have never been educated on this topic either. And I know they would love to like help and support you that way. So, yeah. So once we, once we ovulate, right, egg is released now we officially go into what is called the luteal phase. And in the luteal phase, as long as ovulation has happened, we now get an increase in our other sex hormone called progesterone. If we don't ovulate, we do not make progesterone. You'll still be in the luteal phase, but it's going to feel very different. So like ovulation is necessary for that to happen. I think that's like a really important distinction for people to, to understand Um, is that we want you to ovulate for that reason. Let's talk about what does progesterone do and why is that important? That's a big one. That's really, really important. Absolutely. And and most women only really have heard about it in relationship to fertility because it is important for fertility. It helps maintain and grow the uterine lining, create a nice little nest for that little egg. But it has a lot of other effects too. It's it's an anxiolytic, which means it's anti-anxiety. So we talked about these hormone brain connections. Well, one of the main metabolites of progesterone, it's called allopregnanolone. This actually helps with the activity of a calming neurotransmitter called GABA in the brain. So when we have progesterone, it actually helps us sleep better. We're more efficient with our sleep. It helps us have a calming impact which is going to offset the other things that are happening in our body right now. Because as we're, we're in this luteal phase, there's other things, there's other things going on that are very different than follicular phase. So now we actually tend to not handle stress quite as well. We're a little more sympathetic dominant in the luteal phase of our cycle. Um, that's not to say that you can't handle stress at all, but we're not quite as primed to recover and handle it the way we did in follicular phase. For those of you who may have like an aura ring or whoop, you may notice that your heart rate variability lowers in the second half of your cycle. That readiness lowers, right? So you can actually see this on different like tech tools, things like that. So not as, not as great with stress. And we're also less insulin sensitive, uh, meaning our, our metabolism can shift a little bit. We can have a little more blood sugar swings, a little more prone to being hangry or getting those other feelings. So you know, at least progesterone, the anti-anxiety impact helps us with the emotional aspect of that if we have it, but we still have to look at what's happening metabolically under the hood and adjust things as well, right? So because that insulin sensitivity drops, um, we may not do as great with things like longer fasts. We may not do it. With, we, we probably do want to have some like good quality carbohydrate sources in with our meals here, things that help us a little bit more with keeping that metabolism in check, keeping our blood sugar as regulated as possible without adding excess stress to the body. We also tend to start to feel like we want to rest a little bit more, take a little bit more recovery time, maybe go a little bit more internal. For some women, this can happen the entire luteal phase. For others, it can be more towards the end of it. It depends on on the woman, but I think those are just big trends to, to look out for. But everything about the luteal phase is not like a negative. I will say the other things is our brain volume actually expands in size a little bit during this phase, I think by like 2%. And other areas of the brain that light up with progesterone production are 
actually things like this is a really good, like get shit done phase from like a non-social perspective. Like this is a really good time. If you, if you are a business owner, if you have things to do, to do like your admin work, to like follow through on the plans you created for yourself earlier. It's a great time for like learning and memory retention. So if you're like me and you have like all of these summit recordings and master classes and podcasts like lined up, um, I'll do those a little bit more in my luteal phase. Cause like, first I want the alone time a little bit more. So it's a great time to just like go on a walk, hang out with me. Uh, but it's also a really good time to learn and integrate those memories as well. Um, so a good time to kind of do those sorts of things The the non-social aspects of life and business can, can really be elevated here as well. And of course we can reflect this with our biohacking too. If we know we're not as resilient to stress, if we know we're a little bit more prone to these other things, like, okay, well, if I still want to do my sauna and cold plunge example, maybe I'm just in the sauna for like 20 minutes or less, not pushing myself for an hour, right? Maybe I'm just doing a cold shower or like a quick, like you said, just getting my like face in the water or like a quick 30 second dip in a cold plunge tub versus five minutes. Like get the benefits, feel better without overly stressing my body out. Mm -hmm. Maybe instead in the luteal phase, I'm doing things like grounding, whether that's outside in nature or on a grounding mat. Maybe I'm doing more like meditation or sound healing, things that really help calm down my body and like offset that sympathetic dominance that can happen in this phase a little bit more. Love that. Incredible. Okay. And then we have one more phase, right? Yeah. And then we have our menstrual phase, right? Time our actual bleed week, right? Really what we look at in this phase, and I, I kind of include those like last two days before you start bleeding, because that's really when our hormones now start to drop out. When we get a reduction, a, a drop in our progesterone and estrogen, that's kind of the signal to start bleeding. If any of you are like me, this is not the time that you want to like be out around a bunch of people. Like I really have a solid day and a half that like, if I could just be by myself, that would be like that would be the best thing in the world. Obviously, like it can't always happen that way, but I know that like I'm wired to just kind of go internal, to rest, to slow down a little bit and and, and to really just pay attention to what I intuitively want to do each day. Uh, women's intuition is really strong during their bleed week, during their menstruation. Literally like hormones have left the body. Like there's nothing there for us to drive us in these different directions. It's literally like an internal compass saying like, we took all this away, sit down and rest. We're going to just like get through this and then you'll feel them when they come back up. So it is a great time to like reflect, to think about life in general, like how things are going for you to take time to rest, to, to go internal and just do, do inner work and do what feels good. I personally still like to move and exercise. Even if I am menstruating, I'm just not like going for a PR or doing the like hit class. I'm going on walks, I'm going on hikes. Maybe I'm doing a yoga class. I'm just moving my body. Maybe I'm doing mobility stuff, things that just feel good, help move the inflammation through because we can get a little more inflammation at this time. But it's like more restorative, more restorative types of, of movement is what's happening then. And that's really how you can approach all these other areas, right? Nutritionally speaking, okay, I'm going to make sure I'm eating really good, nourishing, warming foods that are anti-inflammatory because I want to flush the inflammation that's happening as I bleed. Maybe I want to do a little like quality red meat or other iron containing foods to offset the blood work, the blood loss, uh, move my body just to feel good, take lots of rest for me, probably not do any like insane biohacking, maybe just like some gentle grounding stuff. Some women do feel good when they cold plunge on their period, mm. find it like helps with the inflammation. Uh, but I think shorter is probably better for most women. Um, but yeah, I think it's just a good time to, to practice cueing into what you need more so than anything else. I think that's so beautiful. And again, that just touches on the big takeaway. My goal for every woman listening to this episode, it's in that phase, I think nails it. That phase nails it. It's this, we have this intuition, we have this inner guide, we have this inner knowing. And it's interesting that that's what is peak when we lose all our hormones. So for menopausal women, and again, like you said, you know, postmenopausal women are, it's, it's, they're having their moment right now. Finally, there's information coming out. And I think when you can understand that, you know, it's like your neurochemical armor is coming down. Well, guess what? This is your peak wisdom years. This is your peak intuition. And can we start to lean into that instead of feeling like we've got to get our brain to function in today's society? Like, can we start to step back into that? Because I know you've talked about, you know, the beauty of the red tent. And our, our bodies have not changed over the thousands of years. And women in the past during this phase of our cycle, 
we were invited to step away from the community and step away from our jobs and tasks to gather together because this is when we collectively, you've said this before on a podcast, we helped solve the challenges of the tribe and of the community. And what I see happening now, I mean, I've definitely been guilty of this, but for any woman listening, like I think so often at this phase in our cycle, we slam the caffeine, right? We completely negate this beautiful part that makes us the powerful feminine that we are. We slam the caffeine to live in the world that we've created for ourselves today. And Mm -hmm. just knowing what's happening, you know, maybe that gives us the permission to be a little bit internal as we go through our day, a little bit quiet, a little bit like less feeling like we need to caffeinate to be so outward uh, when we're feeling, you know, chill, right? How cool of a world would it be where you know, your, your closest girlfriends, your closest circle of women, like understanding maybe where they are at on their cycle. And when one of you is in that bleed week, like, can you imagine receiving a call from a friend at that moment and being like, Hey, I know you're on your bleed week. Like, can I do anything for you this week to make things a little easier? So you can take a little time for yourself. Like we we think about that and we're like, Oh my gosh, that sounds really weird. But really like, that's what we used to do all the time. Like it's just now been taught that like, you don't talk about those things, but really it would make our, you know, as women, we thrive in communities for a reason and being able to pick each other up. You know, we think about our, our friends who have had kids. What do we do when they're at home healing from the birth? Can I drop off meals? Like, how do I make this easier for you? Well, really same goes when you're, when you're there, when you're trying to operate and wear all these hats of modern life, but still have that same biology, right? Like we can figure out new ways of operating. I think as communities that help us all lean into that a little bit more and understand that that support system is there. Um, and also doing that for ourselves. I personally love if this happened to me last week, I was supposed to be on a podcast and she texted me the day before. And she's like, I wasn't thinking when I scheduled this, like I'm going to be on my period. Do you mind if we reschedule this? Cause I really just want to take that day for myself. And I was like, yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. I want you to do that. Yeah. And I was like, I'm so happy that this is what women are doing now. This is what we really need to be doing. Um, it's okay to like, take that day for yourself and set those boundaries and not, not push yourself just because that's what we're supposed to do. Right. Um, it's actually not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to take rest. So we should be doing that instead. Yeah, I think there's also this beautiful movement in in man world, <laughs> in the guys yeah. out there that are wanting to understand their partners better. So like you said earlier on, like these are things to share with your partner. You know, there's the power of love languages. Like how do you show your partner you love them? Well, one great way, share this episode with your partner, have them scoop to the part about the cycle syncing and understand what you're going through each week. Like, you know, maybe there's a certain time during your cycle where you just want that like tea in your bed or that coffee in your bed, or, you know, these are great times to do, um, hardcore workouts together as partners. And these are other times to like snuggle up on the couch. I mean, I think that's how, you know, as communal beings, as women, like that's how we integrate that with our partners as well. Absolutely. And I mean, I think that's really natural, especially in that, again, that luteal phase when we're like sympathetic dominant, like that co-regulation, it's going to feel really natural to gravitate to your partner and be like, I don't know why I need a hug, but I just need a hug. Yeah. Well, now you do know why you need a hug. Like yeah. your body's really smart and and that's very calming on the nervous system, right? So yeah, guys, like your, your partner may want a little more of that time for most of the luteal phase. There may be a day or two before a period where she's like, don't touch me. No. Um, but, <laughs> totally. but otherwise like that, that, that little bit of contact and connection is like, Oh yeah, I actually this makes me feel much better right now. Um, so things to think about. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And we can empower our sons, right? I have these conversations with my boys. It's like, hey guys, I need a little extra support this week. Like, why not raise our kids from this age to understand that? My daughter too. Like she's watching me and learning. And I love that these are things that we're talking more openly about as women. Dr. Laura, this was incredible. As always, I just love picking your brain. Um, Let me know, do you have any free gifts for the listeners and where can everybody find you? I do. I have a new free gift I can share actually um, that's very aligned with this topic. I made a biohacking guide for women that literally takes you through the different phases of your cycle as well as perimenopause and postmenopause. Uh, and shows you how to incorporate different biohacking tools accordingly. So it's just like your little guide to figure out when to do it and how to do it. And you can find me either my website or Instagram, social channels, just drlauradisasteris. I'm on all of them. 
Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for everybody listening. I know you got a ton out of this episode. We would love to hear your comments below. Let us know, you know, maybe a part of your cycle that you learned about or your favorite tool that you're going to start to incorporate. If you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and throw a like under it. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. And of course, we know there's a woman in your life or a man who needs some of this information. Go ahead and hit that share button and send it their way. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon.